Welcome to Gripfast Artworks. I'm Christopher Leslie. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to create a neutral value sphere in charcoal on Strathmore 400 drawing paper. You can see here that I've already prepped my paper to have this nice, slightly lighter neutral tone along with this crisp white border. I have a separate video on how to do this. It's very easy and it's very quick, but just keep in mind that normally when you go about a drawing, you wanna leave on your border tape until you're actually finished with the drawing. It just happens to be that I was working on another demo for another project and I had it available. You can see just off camera, I actually have my reference sphere. You can find a 4K version of this in the description as well. And I'm just doing some sharpening and prepping of my work table that's off to the camera to the right and the various bits of old charcoal dust that I like to have handy. Again, this is pretty much how you can create that tone. And I like to sharpen my raw charcoal just with a makeup pencil sharpener. It has a very nice sharp blade and I can get a relatively sharp point with extremely soft vine or willow charcoal. So I know I'm going to draw this sphere and I want it slightly larger than the diameter of my hand. And it, you can use the overall arm technique almost like you're uh, a steam engine and you can move your arm at the shoulder to create several paths to make a relatively round sphere but I'm lazy and even though I could do that, I started to look at different manufactured goods in my house that are perfectly circular. So I can essentially cheat my way when drawing the outline of this circle. So I do have some high quality tools. I could use this compass here. I don't really wanna put a hole in the middle of my paper because that would be visible and it's actually too small. So next I thought I could use this paper plate and it's about a good size that I'm looking for. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use that. It's already die cut and it's gonna be pretty much perfect, better than I can do with my hand. So when I place it on the paper, I just make sure that it's relatively centered. The human eye will find those sorts of, uh, not necessarily mistakes, but inconsistencies. So it's very important to just take a quick Again, relative measurement with my drawing stick. And you can see that the vacuum that the paper plate creates as I press on it is actually what sticks it to the page. So I go ahead with my charcoal and I just make an outline. I'm not doing anything magical here. And now we have our basic geometry for our circle. So I will have to do some cleanup later. But this little line sort of bothers me straight out of the gate. So I go ahead and just remove that. I do expect all the edging of this sphere to get more attention throughout the drawing process. So I have this globe of the moon and it's a little difficult to tell with the light for, for the recording purposes, but I know that there's going to be a hot spot on the sphere where the light is bouncing very harshly off of the surface and back toward the viewer's eye. This is what actually allows us to see. It is the reflective light. And I know that there's going to be a gradation from that hot spot around the surface of the sphere. So I need to decide where that is in my drawing. And I'm going to go ahead 
and just put a very brief zone. It's just this is just note taking in the drawing of where I think that hot spot is going to live. And as I'm sitting here, I'm a bit of a dork, and I immediately think of the Death Star, and I wanted to do a little side drawing just for fun. I get very anxious when I do drawings, especially when I'm making demos. And so I like to sort of dial back my ego and my insecurities and just do something fun. For you students that are just starting out, this is this also has a practical purpose in that if you make a mistake or you feel that you've goofed the drawing since you're working in this charcoal, it's very forgiving. And as you can see, I can take my chamois and I can just wipe out anything that I don't like or that I don't want. And it's, it's gone, practically invisible, almost as if it never happened. So I'm just doing a bit more sharpening. I like to keep my charcoal very sharp. Again, this is just a makeup eyeliner pencil sharpener. You can find it at Target, Walmart, any place like that. It'll last a lot longer and it keeps things sharper, more so than a typical 2B pencil sharpener. Sometimes it does get clogged. The drawing stick is really perfect for, for getting into the sharpener and cleaning it out. So back to the hot spot, I'm gonna block that in essentially. I try to keep the lisp working with the shape as the light hits the surface of the sphere. And I'm just using my drawing stick to think about the angle or the angle of approach of the light. The light really isn't coming from the top right corner. It's coming from back over my right shoulder. So I know there's going to be another zone that is less reflective than the hot spot. And I'm literally just putting that in as it might appear versus my reference. Again, I know there's going to be a midtone in the sphere. And every concentric ring is going to be compressed as it turns away from the viewer on the far top right surface of the sphere. And it appears larger toward the left bottom corner of the drawing because that zone is closer to your eye. You can actually see more of it. Now, one thing I like to remind students is that you shouldn't be drawing from your wrist. You should be drawing from your arm or your elbow. If you try to draw with a piece of charcoal like it's a pencil, it's going to be a very frustrating exercise and you will tend to smudge things. So one thing, a very simple thing, but very effective is that you can essentially transform these bits of charcoal into, for all intended purposes, a paintbrush. If you have a bamboo tree or uh, at like a local park, you can find these just laying on the ground. And if you cut with a razor blade, maybe a half an inch or three quarters of an inch at the end, you can then pull them apart and you can slip in that charcoal. Mine broke, so fortunately I have several that I, I keep on hand at all times. And I just, I'm going to go ahead and create a new one off, off camera. This method really keeps your wrist from moving. And in, in some ways, it will help train you for oil painting later on. Charcoal drawing at a certain point becomes very painterly and you build up many layers and you work positively by putting material on the page and negatively by removing that material off the page in layers. I really love charcoal drawing because it behaves so similar 
the oil painting. So here we go. I have my new bamboo stick and I went ahead and put a bit of painter's tape to help prevent separation. And now I'm going to start blocking in the values for this value sphere. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that as I apply the value to the sphere, I'm treating the marks to work with the surface or the direction of the sphere and the light. I'm not working left to right or vertically. I'm putting down that value that is essentially parallel to the light source. And this is what I really mean. I'm not going to shade or put down value perpendicular to the light source. It won't look as good, it won't be as convincing, and the blending process will be more difficult. And we really want to create a sphere that is very neutral with some texture. That's the texture of the, the physical charcoal on the page and the tooth of the paper. But we don't want to add any necessary textures or marks that don't make sense to the light that we're trying to convey when we render the sphere. So I'm just going to remove this from the tone of the page. We don't need that. And I'm just going to try to clean up this a little bit. I notice there's some marks and a few little light spots when I use the paper plate. So just need to keep in mind that light source. And a lot of students at this point, or at least with this exercise, they assume that they can throw down a cast shadow without having a real life example, without using direct observation. This is a mistake. I know the light is coming from over the right shoulder. It's not just coming from the right top side. So I can't safely assume here what this cast shadow would look like. I literally don't know what it looks like. Now, over time with experience, you can approximate this to a very high degree of accuracy. That's not really the scope of this demo. So here I just threw down a little bit more value in that core shadow area and I need something to compare it to. So when I'm looking at a value scale, I can't just work on one side of the scale. I need to work from both sides at the same time to add material to the page and also to remove material from the page. To create convincing realistic drawings, you need a wide range of values just like you see in the natural world. This is why I'm now working in that hotspot or the highlight. The true highlight area will actually be a, quite a bit smaller than this area that I'm erasing out now. And as I go around in this area, I can pull in some of that the neutral background and it dulls the area so it gets smaller as I bring more material in with my eraser and here I'm making a mental note of the bands in the sphere versus my value scale if you've seen my demo on how to make a value scale you know that there's about eight swatches in a charcoal value scale there can be more there should really never be any fewer than that. But I'm making that mental note as I'm looking at the scale versus my sphere reference. So 
So here I'm starting to pull the material from the core shadow into the neighboring zones of value as I build up the overall tone of the sphere. A true neutral value sphere is not white. That would be the absolute opposite of a neutral sphere. The neutral sphere sits in the middle of the value scale. So I need to tone the sphere darker than the tone of my page, but still convey those rings or those bands of values to make it look realistic. So I'm always going to put material down in the core shadow and pull it into those other areas. Really what we're doing at this point is just prepping the surface of the sphere. So later as we develop the drawing, we can really throw down the core shadow with our compressed charcoal. I'm not really doing anything magical here either. I'm I'm literally just smearing the material back and forth into those those rings of value. But I am being pretty careful not to break that edge or the geometry of the original sphere from the plate. I'll build up the volume, push and pull it to make it round and realistic and I'll go ahead and use the stick of charcoal to backfill that very small area that is really too tiny to use my finger. This area is so small that it would be difficult to film placing down the value parallel to the light source. And there's going to be so much blending in this area anyway, since it is such a small area. We can go ahead and just put it down with the charcoal, almost like a border. Just putting that little bit of edge already makes the sphere seem much more realistic, but we have a long way to go before this is in a finished state. So a really important tool to have that's very simple to make is a mall stick. A mall stick is literally just a, a stick or a dowel. It could be a mop handle or a broom handle. And it's just simply used to keep your arm, your elbow, and your wrist off of the page. So you can go ahead and backfill those areas very precisely without risking smearing the work that you've already laid down. You can find these sticks online. They're, in my opinion, they're a ripoff. You can go to any hardware store and just get a three foot dowel that's maybe five eighths in diameter. And that's all you really need. So here I'm putting some hatch marks between that border value that I laid down and again, I'm reminding myself of those value numbers versus my value scale. I repeat this to myself out loud. I make a mental note of it. So I'm always aware of it as I'm putting down value. So here's General's Compressed Charcoal. This is what I'm going to use for the core value and really heighten the value in this drawing. Again, the more values and the broader range of values that you have in a drawing, the more realistic it's going to be. I know that core shadow sits in between the areas that receive some light, but the core shadow is pretty much the opposite side of the light. 
as it curves around the sphere. And I want to be very conservative when I start putting down compressed charcoal. Vine and willow charcoal is very forgiving, as I demonstrated in the beginning of the demo. Compressed charcoal, however, is very unforgiving. It has oil binders inside the charcoal, and it's literally, as it's called, it's compressed with pressure. And it's very difficult to remove once you put it down. So it can be used to great effect, but you have to be very sort of gentle in your application. Here I'm putting down that compressed charcoal in patches, and they're slightly, I don't want to say perpendicular, but they are at a different angle than the original placement. And this is, I'm sort of trying to channel my Proudhon drawing style here in that I want the saturation into the paper with this medium to be absolute in the core shadow. The camera recording is much, it, it's much more grainy on film than it is in person. You can really smear the compressed charcoal as you blend it with the vine and willow and it it just saturates the paper in a in a very beautiful way that is hard to convey over camera and doing a bit of slight cross hatching allows that effect to take place once you start blending Now, I really enjoy the tactile response of working on a drawing and sort of the emotional attachment that I get from using my finger. I don't know if it goes back to kindergarten or, you know, doing finger painting or, or it, I just like the physicality of it. And so you won't really ever see me use blending tools. I like to use my hands, my finger. I like to use my eraser to make marks as well and blend as we've already seen and of course using a chamois. I don't use an actual genuine chamois. I do have them. Um, I will use them if I feel the need to, but my chamois is actually an old dress sock and I've been using it for years and years and it, it just, it works well for me. So you can save a couple bucks and, and use a old dress sock if you can't absolutely afford a, a real genuine leather chamois. So here I've laid down more material and I'm starting to push and pull the compressed charcoal out of the core shadow into the midtones. And this does take a bit of work blending back and forth. And as I blend with my finger, I'm going, at least mentally, I'm going around that ring that I initially drew. And I'm just trying to push it into every little spot that I can that I think is appropriate versus my reference, of course, to saturate that paper. Along this far, I guess, edge is a clumsy way to describe it, but around the perimeter toward the right top corner, the mid-tone is receding away from the eye on the sphere surface. And so it's going to look relatively dark along that edge. It's not that the core shadow is going up into that area. It's actually turning away from the eye. So you're seeing a horizon line on the sphere. If you can imagine this being a, a planet, if it was very, very large, you know, earth scale. Um, you're going to see that terminator as the light moves away from your eye. Now I want to use my eraser. My eraser's dirty. My fingers are very dirty. So a quick clean, knead them up, 
and I'm going back to resuscitate that very light zone where the light is actually hitting the sphere. Now here's my, my chamois, my dress sock, and I'm going to bring back that high contrast because I want that mid-tone, but I don't want it to be dark like that core shadow. So I'm smearing and I'm blending everything that my finger couldn't do to essentially make the neutral value or the neutral color of the sphere. So I've dialed it way back. So much in drawing and, and painting and art making in general, but especially charcoal drawing is this push and pull procedure. Adding material, pulling material, making corrections, adding more material. This is how you effectively build up a drawing over time. So here in my eraser, I've created a flat edge and I'm going to use this as a blending tool. Again, I mark out that hot spot, that highlight, and now I'm going to remove areas around that hot spot and smear the blended charcoal. I'm essentially building up a texture on the sphere. And you notice I'm not using my wrist to do this. I'm using my arm at the shoulder. You can see here how saturated the eraser got as a blending tool. So just a quick cleanup here. Now here I'm making a point. I'm going to bring back that highlight. You may have noticed as I've pushed and pulled the material on the sphere, the highlight area that's lighter than the midtone starts out rather large and it gets smaller over time. So every time I do this, I am creating a more relative transition between the core shadow to the midtone to the highlight area and eventually will put down the most intense area of pure reflected light. And that'll be the smallest area. So here now I'm more delicately making a transition zone between the core shadow and the midtone. And one thing too I should mention that as the drawing is built up over time, as material is put on and then removed and then put on again, and things are blended over and over to create the effects where I want them, is that physically I'm actually pressing down with less force every time this process is restarted. If I attack the drawing with the same amount of physical force as I did in the beginning, I would be removing a lot of the work that I did before. So over time, it needs to become a more gentle process.
know, I'm starting to see that transition zone and I'm starting to like what I'm seeing, but I really need to define the core of the core shadow as well, because I, I kind of lost that a little bit. And so I'm, I'm going to put down more charcoal where I think it's missing versus where it's going to be just absolutely the darkest possible. mid-tone areas are probably going to be the five or six swatch number on the value scale. And, and again, I have a video on this on how to create a value scale. But looking at my value scale, which is off camera, I know that that transition inside the mid-tone is going to have a couple of swatches as it transitions. So it can be a a little misleading when I say mid-tone. There's actually several different values that will span the mid-tone area on this value sphere. One thing to watch out for for the beginning student is that the mid-tone starts again on the far side of the core shadow as that core shadow can only be in an area that is essentially the opposite of the light source as it turns away from the eye. That's what actually makes it look dark. So there has to also be some sort of not direct light source behind the sphere, but there has to be some ambient light in this environment or in this universe to clue us into the back side of the sphere. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to distinguish a perimeter of the sphere when we look at it. Again, a clumsy way to describe this is that there's an edge to the sphere in the drawing, but in our brain, we make the assumption that it is round in three dimensions. And that backside mid-tone where it leaves the core shadow is what indicates that to us to make that assumption in our mind. It's not that we actually see these other things. Here I'm just putting in some very small areas where the core shadow was kind of choppy and the mid-tone was kind of choppy and I'm just starting to backfill some of those areas. I took a big risk there. I almost touched the neutral tone of the page, and I had, I had almost forgotten that my finger was covered with compressed charcoal. That would have been a mistake. And so I'm being uh, a little bit cautious here because I almost made that that error. And here I'm taking the edge of my chamois. Again, this is an actual dress sock. And I'm going to start cleaning up the edge of the drawing because I don't like sort of these stray hairs or these marks that are coming off because it's kind of throwing, it's distracting me literally as I'm doing the drawing. I want to keep my sphere nice and round. There was a tiny little dent in the edge here. And so I'm using my mall stick and I'm using the very sharp edge of this bit of charcoal to just very gently build that edge back up and make that transition value. This is the sort of 
precision mark making that if you tried to do with your wrist, you would just fumble. You would you would go in there very clumsily and, and just foul the edge completely. And you can see how similar the strokes that I'm making with this bit of bamboo and the charcoal is just like a paintbrush. Periodically, I do blow off the drawing. You tend to get a charcoal fall uh, in the most intense areas, and it it sort of collects down at the bottom. So I make sure to occasionally, but gently, safely blow on the drawing yeah. to get rid of that excess dust that I don't want fouling the rest of my drawing. And especially in this demo, since I've already removed the painter's tape, that creates that white border. I want to keep it away from that area. Not really sure what my dog was barking at <laughs> at this point in the video, but I have a Dotson, so it's probably a nothing. Or maybe he doesn't like what I'm doing. Everyone's a critic. One thing that I always tell my students is that good drawing is very similar to good food and slow cooking. There's a lot of dead time between prepping my eraser or sharpening my charcoal or grabbing tools that I want to use for the next step that I'm going to immediately put on the page. And it's slow by design. This helps prevent me to make mistakes where I make an assumption that I know more than I really do. And over time, experience can help in this regard. And if, I mean, literally, you need to practice your way out of making stupid choices that really can, can foul a work. But the dead time that you see in the video is really important. A drawing should be developed over time with care and intent. Every mark should be done with intention. It should not just be to get it done or to, to fill an area that you believe should be filled just because it's blank paper. Drawing is it's essentially a science that we're being methodical with our direct observations. In this case, we're, we're using a, a reference because it's just a value sphere. But it should never be rushed. Breaks should be taken. Your eyes need to rest, and those assumptions that your brain is auto-correcting for you can actually hurt the drawing overall. I like to tell my students that if you have a memory of a really good meal uh, for Americans, it's obviously going to be Thanksgiving or maybe Christmas dinner. Your loved ones spend a lot of time and a lot of care creating those types of meals because they know they're special, they're not ordinary, and they take a lot of work and they take a lot of effort. You can't reduce delicious sauces you know, quickly in the microwave. It just doesn't work. That's how you should approach realistic drawing as well. With more practice and more personal development, your skill set will grow over time with this process, with the slow method, and you will get faster as your toolbox grows, essentially, your, your skill level increases. But not rushing a drawing is, it, it's like half the battle.
So like I mentioned before, the midtone actually has several zones or rings of value within the midtone. Um, that's a little confusing because you think a midtone is just a singular area, but there is that transition area. And all I'm doing in the drawing now, just like in the very beginning, I'm just using my finger to blend those zones so the transitions seem invisible. There isn't going to be a harsh, no, lack of a better word, a line um, or a very tight area of value that looks like a printed ring. It should be very gradual. The neutral value sphere is not white. It's not black. It sits somewhere in the middle of the values. There's an actual color to the sphere. And it is only the effects of light that allow us to, one, observe it, but also to cue in the dimensionality, the physicality of the sphere in the picture plane window. I want those transitions to be very gentle. Every time I use my eraser or I use the direct application of the medium, I go in with my finger and I blend those transitions. So I don't really like this area when I'm looking at this. It looks very spotty. You can tell that the oils from my fingertips have just kind of made this texture that I don't like. It's, it's a good idea when you're working with charcoal that if you notice your hands are sweating to keep a paper towel readily available so you can dry your hands off. And I'm going to essentially repair this area because it's too modely for my tastes. One thing I'd like to say to any of my students who are doing this project is to take it seriously that this is a beginner's project to understand in a very basic form how light works and how to apply this medium. I want to encourage them as I want to encourage everyone who does drawing and painting and printmaking and any artistic endeavor to do the best that you possibly can even when you believe that the task is mundane that you yourself deserve an output and a product better than you may assume now what i'm i'm trying to say is that you can believe you can produce something that is very high quality and is something to be proud of even though the project or the task that you're you're doing or trying to accomplish doesn't seem really that important in drawing everything is built upon what comes before it and so in your studies, if you take something like this exercise, that is a beginner's exercise, but you take it to be serious and worthwhile, that that mental note or that, that mental um, state will increase your product.
Now, as I look back at this, I can see that the bottom area, the sphere got really lumpy over the course of the drawing. And so I need to make a correction. And I'm not sure if the dog's moan is going to be in the final uh, output of the demo, but man, he really <laughs> doesn't like what I'm doing. He's literally growling at me as I'm making this demo. So I couldn't take the dog's criticisms any longer, so I took a break. And now that my eyes have rested, I've come back to this value sphere. And I noticed there's some areas that I don't like. And I noticed that it it's a little lumpy, not exactly at the, the bottom of the sphere, but slightly to the left. And I need to make some corrections before I can call it good enough for the demo. Breaks are really, really important. They relieve the stress of doing the work. I tell all my students that drawing is a full contact and mental sport. It's, it's sort of like the football of art making. Your mind is constantly at work. Your eyes are constantly moving back and forth. Your arm is extended as you draw it's it's very physical but it the the mental demands as you push back on assumptions and check direct observations it can be very taxing and then you have at least in my experience then you have the the bad guy syndrome or the imposter syndrome uh, my fears and my insecurities that i'm i'm not really cut out for doing this and that there's so many better, more accomplished people, um, better teachers, better artists. And those, those sorts of thoughts especially can be absolutely exhausting. So when you take a physical break from working on your, your drawing or your painting, you refuel. Um, I, I like to say that, hey, when you take your break, go get something to eat, go do something else, play a video game, go to the store, go outside, and come back in three or four hours, then resume your work. You have rested eyes. Your brain has sort of calmed down from the process of drawing and the stresses that are involved when making artwork. In order to clean up that mid-tone and, and coarse shadow area, I've been using my kneaded eraser and I've gone into those areas that seem blotchy or patchy and I'm removing material and re-blending the area. And you'll notice that even the eraser marks tend to follow those parallel lines that I talked about in the beginning to keep things consistent. You know, light is a very complicated subject. Essentially, for the artist, it helps to keep in mind or, or remember as we work and we make direct observations that light is a particle. It's almost like a little bullet. However, it moves in waves. So when it hits an object, it is reflected off those objects or certain wavelengths, certain colors of light are absorbed by an object. That's, that's how we actually can see color, that it's absorbing a certain wavelength of light, and then we see that light as that color. Um, 
the light that's reflected reaches our eyes. So if you think of like a rose is red, it's reflecting that wavelength. And that's what actually enters our eyeball. And that's how we see it as red. So for this drawing, the neutral value of the sphere is the color, even though this is monochromatic drawing of the sphere. And so as I continue to blend and as I continue to use my eraser to make those marks, I even want those marks, those eraser marks, to follow the path of what I'm assuming are the paths of the photons coming off the sphere. Now that's a that's going a little bit into the weeds and for anyone who comes across this video who's an actual scientist and and knows more than you know infinitely more than i will ever know how how light works uh, i apologize but it's these sorts of bits of knowledge that can really help you not only look for how light is behaving and how to apply values to convey an object and render it realistically uh, but it also kind of adds to that slower process as well that you're thinking about how the light is coming off an object into the eye. Again, I'm not putting any arbitrary marks on the page because I'm thinking about these sorts of issues. So at this point, I'm really in the cleanup process of this demo. I'm going through in those areas that I may have missed earlier, or I was too aggressive when I was using the eraser to kind of pull the material away. And again, it's a push and pull situation. But if you take it off, you need to put it back on, you need to blend. And I, I just can't live with this bottom edge anymore. It's driving me insane. So I know I'm, I'm going to need pretty much all my tools to make this correction on this edge. Cleaning my eraser, getting my mall stick ready about what I want to do to make it right. So there's a very small point on this edge toward the top right. I will admit that I kind of did chicken out on the bottom edge. So I'm going to start with what's easy. Another tip that is maybe not exactly self-evident for the beginner is there are no lines in nature. Now I can hear some of you already saying that there sure there are. There's like t-shirts and letters and signs and billboards. Those are objects in the natural world, but those are not natural objects when it comes to realistic drawing and rendering a drawing we must avoid 
outlining as much as possible. The natural world only has transitions of value. Sometimes those transitions can be very, very small, very or extremely precise. Uh, so at a distance, it does look like there's harsh lines, like in shadows and things. Now, this goes all the way back to the beginning of the demo when I said, I cannot assume what this cast shadow off this sphere will look like because I'm, I don't know. Sure, I can make an approximation. I can make a guess. I've, I'm educated. I've been doing this for many years. Is anyone going to notice how bad it is? Eh, maybe not, but I will know. And compared to a real object, it will be a failure. So we want to make sure that our observations are coming from nature to make things realistic. So we want to avoid edging as much as possible. Now, with that said, I need to repair this perimeter on the sphere. And the only way I can do that is by putting down more material. And we know that the light or the surface of the sphere turns away from us. The light will seem to darken. And that gives us essentially an edge. Now, to make this sort of correction, I'm not going to just accept that I have to work in a particular way, especially since this object is round. I'm going to move my drawing paper and change my clips in any way that I need to achieve my goal of making the correction. And as I turn the paper, the sphere and its lack of roundness will become more evident to me as I go about making the correction. This also presents an opportunity to get that mid-tone right against the core shadow, where in the horizontal position, I really couldn't do that, simply because I'm right-handed and I have a camera on the left side. I'm going to take advantage of the tools at my disposal. and I'm not going to accept a lumpy sphere. Time to move the page once again. When you're moving your paper on a raw charcoal drawing, it's imperative that as you make these sorts of moves, that it's very secure as you make the move. It would be absolutely catastrophic if you were to drop the drawing on a carpeted floor. You'd lose all your work. So as I clean this eraser, it's quite obvious how much the sphere roundness improved just by turning the page and making some very minor corrections. It's incredible what the brain will do when looking at an object over time. So here I'm thinking about how the reflected light in the highlight can be further heightened. And I know that there's going to be a very, very small area in the sphere, or I should say on the sphere, where the light is coming off of the sphere, being reflected directly into the viewer's eye. And that small area should be as white as possible as I can get it. I'm never going to have pure white paper because the paper was toned and I've worked it many, many times. But that 
really small yet intense area is really going to sort of seal the deal to finish the drawing. And I'm just going over that mental exercise once again of how the light is functioning. I'm thinking about what that cast shadow might look like versus what I've actually drawn with the highlight area. I'm imagining what it could be versus my reference. This helps to reinforce what I've done for the highlight, the midtone, the core shadow, and then the far side as well. So for my students who are watching this demo for an assignment, you have to remember that part of your project would to label all of the elements of light, and there's at least seven of them, and they're in the reference, and for anyone doing the demo at home, you'll find that in the description as well. Happy drawing, everyone.